Hi there, my name is Sam Samuels. I'm a senior lecturer within the Warsash Maritime School. Today's presentation is going to be life as an officer in engineering, where we'll look at the engineer, we will look at the marine electrical technical officer, and we will talk about you entering an exciting industry where you'll have the opportunities to earn a good wage, to earn um, time and visit parts of the world that you never thought you'd go to, and to also get a trade which will lead on to further experiences in life and give you something further to look forward to. I'm going to go through a series of slides in a minute, so follow along and hopefully we will answer all your questions as we go through. If there are further questions, you can go to the drop-in sessions afterwards and hopefully we'll be able to resolve those for you. So you want to be an engineer. Do you want to be paid while studying? Know that there's a good chance of you getting a job at the end of the training. Have a very good salary by the early 20s. Travel the world. Even more importantly, get long spells of paid leave. Then this is probably the industry for you. You do need to have an inquiring mind. You do need to have good reasoning capabilities. You're going to have to make decisions very early on. You're going to be in a position of responsibility. You could be the sole person in charge of the machinery of a, of a cruise liner. And your decisions that you make within the first couple of minutes will determine the outcome and hopefully give people the enjoyable experience they require. You're going to have to work under pressure, sometimes huge amounts of pressure. There's not going to be enough hours in the day, so you're going to be tired, you're going to work hard. Also, you're going to have to accept and delegate authority. You're going to be a merchant navy officer, and as such, that comes with responsibility. But above all else, you're going to have to have a sense of humour. It's hard work at sea. You're away from friends and family. So you're going to be able to have to laugh. You're going to have to be able to laugh at yourself and laugh with others. As I said, you've got to be technically minded. You want to have the desire to understand what's going on with a, a technical piece of equipment. The thing is, it doesn't always work first time, so you've got to be able to handle the challenges. You've got to be able to pick yourself up when it breaks. You've got to be able to pick yourself up when you can't work out what's going wrong with it. You're also going to have to take responsibility. At a very early age, you're going to be taking charge of people. You're going to be taking charge of people of different nationalities. You're going to struggle to communicate, so you're going to have to use all the skills we're going to give you. And above all else, when you're at sea, there is no third emergency service. You can't call on the AA, the RAC, green flag. There are others available, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to you. You're going to have to solve the problems. Not in that, you're going to have to work on your own, and at times you're going to have to work in a team. So your whole approach is going to have to be holistically. So, do you think they fit the criteria? We're going to talk about two areas. We're going to talk about the mechanical marine engineer or the electrical marine electrical technical officer. When you're on board ship, perhaps you never think about it, but your responsibility is going to be vast. You've got the ship and the structure to worry about to begin with. The thing that everybody sits on, that belongs to you. Then you've got the obvious things like the propulsion that moves it through the water. Of course that's you. But when you think about being at home, when you wake up in the morning, you turn the light on, you're going to be responsible for that. When you go to the bathroom to clean your teeth, you're going to be responsible for producing the fresh water. Even down to the point of going to the toilet, what goes down the pan? It doesn't just go over the side, it becomes yours. And you'll learn to be excited by the process of turning um, body fluids into a, a, an environmentally friendly subject that we can put over the side. People turn their noses up, but it becomes what life is all about. You're going to have to look after the refrigeration, the air conditioning. In fact, everything that you can think of mechanical is going to be yours. You can imagine the training that's required for this and the knowledge that you need. And then finally, if it all goes wrong, someone's going to have to get into lifeboats and they want to make sure they're going to work. Again, you're going to fix those. And finally, if there's a fire or a flood, there is no fire brigade. It's down to you, and as an engineer, we're going to train you. We're going to train you to deal with all those situations. If you want to come in at the HND level, you're going to require a minimum of four GCSEs, including a good maths, science, and English. You do need good maths. Engineers are always required to do the mathematical calculations. 
If you want to come on the foundation degree route, you're going to require the above, plus an additional 48 UCAS points, including, again, a numerate subject. You can come in as a graduate. It's a different route altogether, and our Q&A people will be able to direct you which way you need to come if you want to come down that route. But you will be fast-tracked. Also, if you're coming from another industry, maybe coming from possibly the, the armed forces, there are routes which will take you in and we will guide you through the most suitable uh, training path that you to come in on. You might even be coming from within the industry as a rating, a motorman, an oiler, and we will again show you how you can progress through and make it into the Merchant Navy. It's interesting, isn't it, to work out the fact that the average student, notes I use the word student, leaves university in 2020 owning somewhere between 45 and 51,000 pounds. Massive amount of money. So why do you want to be a cadet? You're going to leave with an average debt of about 0 to 2,000 pounds. How's that possible? Why does that happen? Primarily because you don't pay for your um, tutorials. You get a small bursary from the company and you're expected to live on that small bursary. And although things may be tight during the first six months of your training, when you go to sea, all your pay is yours. Your food and accommodation is paid for. A bit like living with the bank of mum and dad. You're gonna to have to work hard. You're gonna be different because we're gonna make you wear a uniform. Not because the university want you to do it, but because your companies want you to set the standard. As I said, you're gonna be an officer and that carries responsibility. Also, you're going to have to attend lectures, and it's not, it's not optional. You are being paid to learn, so we will expect to see you at those lectures. And then we're going to give you between 450 and 500 hours in the workshops learning various skills, and I'll talk about those a bit later on. You will have to work hard to pass all the FAY tests and assignments, and there are lots of them. And there are people who do fail. There are people who struggle, but we have a massively dedicated team that will bring you through. And if you've got the right attitude, we can bring you on and we can get you to achieve. Sadly, you're going to have to look after your own domestic life. Cooking, buying your food, washing. You are allowed to iron. But also, you've got to manage your day. And I put that includes getting up and going to bed. Because now you're in the grown-up world. You can't afford to be sleeping in. If you're five minutes late for a lecture, you will not get paid. Your company has got the chance to reduce your wages. And if you're five minutes late at sea and the ship sails, they're going to be going without you. So we start on the footing that we're going to give you the proper drive and we're going to give you the right attitude so that you will achieve when you go to sea. For those of you who are thinking at the moment we're doing everything offline, we certainly are. Will I have to wear uniform there? Of course not. We're sensible people. We know that we don't expect you to sit in a shirt and tie to sit in front of a camera. But once you come back on site and you start working for a living, then yes, you will have to um, tidy yourself up and join the rest of us. So now you're going to have to make a decision about where you want to work. How do you know what training company to go to? Well, I always like this slide because it shows me a nice slow-speed two-stroke engine. Yeah, I'm trying to give you some idea of scale. Most of us who think of two strokes imagine those little um, buzzing, annoying 16-year-olds on their scooters whizzing down the roads. This is real engineering. This is what stirs the juices. This is what gets you excited. And I show you a few details. Tankers and bulk carriers, slow speed two-stroke engines. One has six cylinders, each with a bore of 600 millimeters. 600 millimeters, that is absolutely massive. There are bigger ones. Cruise ships. Who doesn't want to go on a cruise ship, but unfortunately you're not going as a passenger? You are there to service those people. You're going to work long hours. And when you arrive in the exotic ports, you're not going to be running over the gangplank going, yee, party time. No, that's when you're going to get to work as an engineer and you're going to have to work hard. And in fact, I was talking to a, a colleague who's just come back from sea. Uh, he started off as a cadet and 12 years on, he's now a lecturer. And he said, cruise ships, never again, primarily because of the work. But it may suit you, maybe what you want to do. You'll work with diesel electric propulsion. Large four-stroke diesel engines, up to 16 megawatts, driving electrical generators to provide power for electric propulsion motors. 
high voltage generators, extremely dangerous, but we're going to train you so you can deal with them. And look at those little babies. As he pods, it's why cruise ships are so more adaptable these days. They don't need tugs. Those things rotate 360 degrees and a cruise ship can now turn on a sixpence. It can actually hold itself within position with probably within about one to two meters if it needs to. You may fancy something closer to home, traveling across the English Channel or maybe across to Holland. But again, ferries, they're hard work. You only get an hour in port, so defects have to be sorted very quickly. And in fact, a cadet came back. He'd been to France 354 times during his first sea phase. He never went ashore once. Hopefully you're getting the feel now that you're gonna start having to work for a living. Yeah, it's not all work, there is some play, but there's lots of equipment to get familiar with. And that's part of the beauty of this course is we're gonna teach you how all of these things work. You may fancy life on a bulk container. Long periods at sea, into port, out, and away you go. It may, may thrill you. Why does that not sink? Why has it not fallen over? We're gonna teach you that. But then the beauty of this is, look at this. I'd go back to sea tomorrow to work on a ship like this. You can see there, down at the bottom right, they're not dummies, they're real people. And in fact, standing up on the top plates is another real person. Imagine being the chief engineer on a vessel like that. Absolutely incredible. You don't want to get it wrong. You don't want to run out of lube oil. And I often say to people, just imagine the length of the dipstick for that. But as a chief engineer, that would be your responsibility. And it's feasible. Anything is feasible if you come down through this route. You may fancy something, maybe liquid natural gas. Again, people say, well, they're dangerous vessels. They are dangerous. The whole industry is dangerous. But we risk manage it. That's what makes it fun. And obviously they pay a little bit extra for going on these boats, but because they know they're dangerous, they carry out more safety precautions. So you're probably safer and getting paid more for doing it. You may fancy being paid to be shot at. The Royal Fleet Auxiliary. They lead the Royal Navy into war zones. They support. You may fancy the pomp and ceremony that goes with it. You may fancy the opportunity to move across and work with the Royal Navy. It's again a different approach. Talk to the RFA guys. Find out what it, what it means, what it entails. Understand the fact that they have uh, tradition and you may be tying yourself up with something that perhaps you don't like, or maybe it does. And those of you who like being seasick, why not join the offshore support vessels? These are the boats that bob around in the North Sea supporting our oil rigs. Some of them transport goods in and out, so you're traveling across the North Sea in all weathers. Others stay on station on dynamic position boats which hold into position by about a one meter in a, in a, a force eight gale. Not for me, I always get seasick, but again, have a look at it. Talk to the training managers, talk to the training companies, see what they suggest, see what they recommend. And then everyone thinks it's a creme de la creme, the super yacht. Who wouldn't want to be on a super yacht? But again, these people are paying lots of money and they're probably paying you lots of money but they're paying for solutions, not problems. I always say to people, imagine Abramovich. Does he worry whether he's got a four or two stroke engine? Does he whether it's high speed or low speed? No, Abramovich is only interested if he can get his sky, watch the football. Yeah, the rest of it, you just have to sort out and make sure that when he goes for a bath, he has hot water. And when he gets a bottle of champagne out the fridge, it's chilled to the right temperature. So why Solent? Why the Warsash School? Well, in 2017, we moved from our old site down in Warsash near Fareham, and we came to St Mary's campus. The university invested lots of money, 42 million in fact. We now have a superb workshop, which I'll show you some pictures later on, but we also have a, a, a simulation centre, which opened in 2019. The workshops purpose built, fully equipped, for teaching the use of machine tools, welding and electrical maintenance for marine engineers. 450 hours you're gonna spend in this environment. The guys you're gonna work with, the technician instructors, they come from trade. There's the old adage, those that can do, those that can't teach. These guys have done it, they've worked, they've earned their money living uh, in the trade. And now they come to Solent, they bring with them these skills and we pass them on to you. 
No, we're never going to make you a fitter and turner. We're never going to make you a welder. But we're going to give you the skills which we're going to get you out of trouble when you're at sea. As I said, we have a simulator. You won't spend much time in the simulator, primarily because we want you to go to sea. We want you to have it for real. But when you come back later on in your careers, you will work as teams, and it's brilliant as engineers to do team training within the simulator. We will try and get you in there so you get some sort of idea of how the whole thing works. But don't set your expectations. It's going to be the Game Boy environment for you. The beauty of this job is we get the chance. We can try and set fire to you. We can try and drown you. It's not really what we try and do. We actually try and train you so that you can fight fires. And we do real fires. We set you into a fire simulation uh, station. We actually burn wooden pallets. We throw fuel on them so that they are roaring away. It's almost unbearably hot in there. But we will teach you how to fight fires, how to use the equipment, how to recognise the danger how to recognise other people when they're in difficulty. And then, lo and behold, if all of a sudden something goes wrong, we're going to teach you how to survive in a lifeboat. Back in the Second World War, loads of people died. They thought it was because they drowned. But no, they died because of hypothermia. They didn't know how to survive in the water. We've learned, and we're going to teach you how to survive in the water. Down there on the bottom left, you see those great big, uh, well, toy ferries, to, to the average person, but they are simulation boats. They work exactly the same as a vessel would when it's at sea for its real size. Unfortunately, you're not gonna, going to get to have a go on those. But if we get a chance, we'll take you down to the ship handling center and you can have a look around and see the sort of training that your deck colleagues may go through. The Ectic Suite, our electronic chart display and information system. No, you're not going to be doing chart work. But the deckies require someone to fix it, and guess who that is? Welcome to the ETO, you'll be doing that. You will do a small amount of seamanship, but not a great deal, so don't worry too much about it. We're going to send you to sea. After the first six or seven months, you will go to sea for about four months. Not all vessels are calm and uh, serene like this one. Some of them get a little bit lumpy. But during that time, you're going to do, uh, you're going to do two phases, totaling a total of eight months. You'll learn how to operate the main on the auxiliary machinery. You will get some time to study, and you're going to complete a major book called the Training Record Book. You will need that as evidence to show that you've done all the tasks required by the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. You'll be required to take part in routine maintenance, overhauls and repairs. Some of it quite exciting, some of it mundane, but that's what life is like. And if you're lucky, you may even get to take a vessel into dry dock and then see what's under the waterline. And as I said, you're going to get time off. Hopefully you're going to get some time off when you're at sea. Might not happen. But once you're working properly within the industry, you may spend two or three months at sea and then you come home for possibly two or three months. What are you going to do with that time? You're going to spend all your money going on decent holidays, going to the places that you've seen which you like the look of, stopping in top-class hotels and being looked after. And then you're going to be the envy of your friends by sending them social media posts of you spending Christmas in the Bahamas or wherever you choose to go. If you don't want to be mechanical, you can become an electrotechnical officer. It's a complex job. As I said, I talked earlier on about the bridge gear, the Ectis suite. Everything that you ever see on the bridge of a ship, the navigation system, the fire alarms, the, the emergency lighting systems, all of that is going to be yours. Again, you can only come in at a foundation degree level at the moment. You'll require the four GCSEs and 48 UCAS points. And again, you need that numerate subject. It runs much alongside the same as the engineering qualification. But during that time, instead of doing the filing, the fitting, the welding, we'll set you to work on radar, sonar, communications, navigational system. Um, you might even get to change a lamp or even wire a plug we go into the full depths of it. The promotion prospects are similar, but unfortunately the system at the moment will not allow you to become a chief engineer. So some people say, well, what does it mean for me? Well, the advantages are, as you can see on the bottom of that slide there, demand with the super yacht market for good mitos is rapidly growing. Because of the technical details of super yachts, we require technical people, and the mitos are the people who are going to step up to that market. 
Our commitment. Well, we're confident that if you work hard, and it is hard work, please be under no illusion. If you ever talk to the cadets, they will tell you how difficult it is. You will get your HNC, HND, or FD, whichever route you choose to go on. You will get your certificates of competency issued by the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. And that means that you can then go to sea and you can sit in the chair as a marine engineering officer or a marine electrical technical officer of the watch. There's a high probability you'll get the job as a fourth engineer. You'll go straight back to sea. So what about the future prospects? Well, look at this. 2017. Out of 40 marine engineers at Amitos, only 5% were unemployed. And I think I even know that person. I think it was a young girl who went off to start a family. And as you look down those figures, probably the one that's going to jump out you more than ever is look at this UK salary, £21,500. You could be going in earning £33,000. Does that not excite you? There's even more of a bonus, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then with sea time, you move forward. There you are, 20 to 22 possibly if you're coming in at 18. Then you get to the third engineer. You've done more sea time. You get more responsibility. Your money will start to creep up, 32 to 35. And then if you choose to get more qualifications, you can come to Solent University. We run our seniors course, which is open to second engineers and chief engineers. Why not stay with a brand? You know it works. You might have to take a written exam. You might have to take some oral exams with the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. But lo and behold, 35 to 50,000 pounds. And if you put more sea time in, more responsibility, you can finally be picking up a moderate salary of 50 to 75,000 pounds. But read on a little bit. Work to leave ratio, two to one or even one to one. And if you're on a one to one ratio, that means you're out of the country for potentially six months of the year. That means you don't pay tax. Who doesn't want to do the job? Mums and dads now rushing to find out how they sign up for it. You're going to get older. Life changes. So what's out there for you afterwards? Well, as I said, I'm going to start at the bottom. One of our colleagues has just joined us. Ten years ago, he was a, a cadet. He's now a chief engineer. So he's come back as a lecturer. Why have you come back as a lecturer, I ask him. He said, I fancy a bit of nine to five. Why not? He's going to exchange all his knowledge and pass it on to you. But there are other options. Super yachts. Overseeing as a superintendent. You can work for classification societies, which are like insurance brokers. You can work for the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, the police, for want of a better word, of the maritime industry. You can work as an examiner or a surveyor, making sure that vessels are seaworthy. You may still like getting your hands dirty. You can go and work as a ship repairer. Certainly in Southampton, there are hundreds of ship repairers working long hours to keep these vessels at sea. You may just want to use your knowledge and you may want to be a consultant and use your expertise, of which hopefully you will have loads. You may want to come to Solent University to top up your qualifications. And as I said, the first one is there is a BEng, the Marine Engineering Management Top Up. And we've got guys now leaving the HND and the FD um, back in um, August and now, now just starting on the top up course. It's going to take them a year, but they'll have a full honours degree. There are other courses. Don't be shy. Talk to Solent University. See what they can offer you. There's lots of reasons to pick Solent University. A few years ago, we were probably down at the bottom of the rankings, but the university has worked hard. We've listened to our students, we've listened to our customers, and we've worked hard. And you can see there, we're in the top 100 universities by the Guardian University Guide. We were recognised the university impact ratings, uh, rankings for gender equality. 94% of our graduates are in employment. Yeah, as a, as a cadet, you're up to 95. And then down at the bottom, highly motivated, experienced and dedicated staff. We are experienced seafarers. Those that teach you the engineering, the electrical stuff, we've been to sea, we know what it's like. We know what you're going to go through. As I said, some people have done the cadetship themselves. They know exactly what it's like to sit in that chair. It's not work. It's not all work. It's not all play either. But it's a balance. And we have to be careful because a cadetship doesn't run with the timetable of the university. 
As I said, you'll come in for six months. You may spend four months at sea. You'll come back another eight, eight months ashore, another four months at sea, and then you'll come back to finish off. You're going to work hard. You won't have the opportunities to join the sports clubs in quite the same way. Your timetable is going to be full. Some weeks you will be, be taught sort of six or seven hours a day. You're going to spend Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, depending on which course you're on, in the workshops. So you're not going to have the opportunities. But don't be shy. Solent has got lots of facilities. We've got a gym. We've got a social network there. You can still join in, but you just have to temper your beliefs and your excitement for it. So that concludes the PowerPoint. So please, if you've got any questions, do not hesitate to come and talk to us. We're keen to see you at Solent. We're keen to see you at sea, and we're keen to see you enjoying the experiences that many of us have had of seafarers. So use the question and answer facilities or just contact the university directly and someone will speak to you and resolve your problems. Thank you.